Hello, my name is Bob Morford from the Center for Counseling and Student Development, and I am co-presenting here with my colleague, Hillary, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hello, I don't have video, but I am here. My name is Hillary Lyles. I'm one of the alcohol and other drug staff counselors at the Center for Counseling and Student Development. And I'm the Associate Director at the Center for Counseling and Student Development. Welcome to the FYI series. Today's topic is alcohol and other drugs. We want to talk about safety and precautions so we can be healthy pirates and uh, be successful academically. So I'm going to share a PowerPoint. We plan on tending uh, to go here today about 30 ish minutes. We'll see how long how verbal we go. So if you give me just a second, I'm going to pull up the PowerPoint and we'll get started from there. And we're going to start by sharing a little bit more information about the Counseling Center to begin with. And Hillary, are you seeing the, uh, the PowerPoint? Mm -hmm. All righty. Um, so without further ado. All right, it's taking me just a second to get through it. Okay. So that's our bright, shiny faces at the Counseling Center. Uh, helping set this up today is Maya Pittman, front there and center in that video, in that picture right there. Importantly, also the Counseling Center provides free and confidential counseling services to any enrolled ECU student, so they can be taking any credit hours, and it is free and confidential. Let me take just a few seconds here to explain confidentiality because that's one of the most important concepts that we practice at the Counseling Center. That means is an 18 year old or older student at ECU legally and ethically, we cannot release any information about you to anybody outside of our office. That is really to protect your privacy. That is core of what we do. You need to be able to uh, feel free to come into the Counseling Center and share anything that you need to share. Breaking it down a little bit further, that means we can't release any information to faculty, staff, parents, uh, any peers on campus, anything you tell us is absolutely confidential. The only exception to that would be if there's some imminent threat of self-harm or injury to somebody else, then we are mandated reporters. Uh, short of that, everything's confidential, so you can feel free to come in and talk to a counselor and know that that will be that private. If you do want to release information, let's say you wanted a parent involved just for a consultation in your counseling process, you can do that. That means we would need your written permission electronically during this COVID era to do that. Then we can share whatever information and limited to what you want to share in this hypothetical situation with your parent. Again, that's with your permission. Now, typical reasons that we see students at the Counseling Center, why, why do people come into the building you're looking at right there, Umstead Hall, near the new Student Center on campus? Students come in for reasons including, not limited to exclusively, but including anxiety is actually number one. So anxiety issues, a real common anxiety issue might be panic attacks, just kind of general anxiety, maybe some obsessive compulsive uh, tendencies as well. Depression is certainly up there in lists of reasons we see students. Adjustment to college, that's a big issue, mostly during the fall semester when we have a big influx of 4,000 plus incoming first year students, alcohol and other drug concerns. And like I said, Lori said, that's what we're going to be talking about today. Relationship issues, maybe body image issues. We do do consultation services. It's, if you want to consult with us and say, is counseling right for me or not? We'd be happy to do that and we'll help you sort through that. And if it is, we'll see you or refer you. And if not, we'll say, check back in with us later if you'd like to do that. Importantly too, is that second bullet from the bottom, we have crisis services. So that is any time during the day from 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. So we have two screeners available available for urgent access same day. And then importantly as well, that's also after hours. So that's 24 seven, seven days a week whenever school is in session. So that's all fall semester, all spring semester, and then both summer session one and one and two. Our phone number is listed right there. So that's the number you would call after hours uh, for site. And then follow the voice prompts on that message and you would be hooked up live with a counselor 
24 seven if you call that number after hours and then follow the voice prompts. So to get back to what we're talking about today, more specifically after that introduction about what we do at the counseling center, we're gonna talk about alcohol safety and we know college students knock on wood, they're a healthy population. Traditional college age is thought of as 18 to 24 year olds. And when you look at a demographic, that is by and large a healthy de demographic. Unfortunately, sometimes tragically, when things go awry on a college campus with he uh, health issues or injury issues, we know that alcohol is the uh, biggest correlation with that. People, if they drink too much alcohol, sometimes they make poor decisions, their behaviors uh, impacted, sometimes their, their, their ability to um, uh, in all themselves in motor coordination and skills. They might fall down, they might have an accident or injury. So we know alcohol sometimes plays into that. Now, when we talk to college students, we try to be balanced about alcohol. So we talk to college students as the adults that they are. So we're not trying to make decisions for them. We're trying to help with decision-making. We tell students that, back to that page, sorry, skipping around here. If they choose not to drink alcohol, that's certainly this, uh, the safest decision they make. If a student chooses not to drink alcohol, we have a good percentage of students on our campus that don't choose to drink alcohol. They have zero risk for safety concerns. If they choose to drink a little, they have a little bit of a risk. And if they uh, choose to drink a lot of alcohol, obviously, obviously that's going to correlate with a uh, much greater risk. So that's kind of where we're going here today. We really like, love, appreciate all our ECU students. So what we're looking for in the spirit in which we say this is we want them to be healthy. So we share this information so they're better educated about how to make healthy decisions. Now I can go to the next slide. Um, you know, ECU's done this for a long time. We focus on all of our students, be they undergraduate or graduate students. Um, all types of demographics, um, but what we really tend to focus on initially is our first year students. We know students leaving home for the first time coming onto our campus, most of them living in a residence hall or kind of on their own for the first time, making independent decisions for the first time, uh, making choices that they have maybe experienced in high school for the first time. So there's an increased risk especially that first fall semester when students arrive on our campus. Hillary likes to say, so I'm stealing your thunder here, Hillary, that the first uh, uh, six weeks on campus are the most risky and research shows that as well. As again, students are away from home for the first time and they're tempted by peers and oftentimes alcohol is part of that equation. So we mandate students to a uh, first year alcohol other drug prescription and non-prescription drug education program. This year it was called My Student Body. Also with that program is a sexual violence prevention program. And that's why we do it because we're really focusing on these first year students safety. Other risk for first year students is um, that, 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 you know, many of us, when we start school at age 18, we act age 18 or 19. Or sometimes, you know, in my case, if I can self-disclose here a little bit, I was probably immature and developmentally acted more age 16 or 17. Upon graduation, we learn how to pick our punches better academically as well as our social life. So we might mature that last bullet point there five, six years during our course of college. So we kind of learn to tone down or turn down the volume somewhat on our social life. And sometimes that includes partying and decisions related to alcohol as we go through school. Hillary, can I kick it to you here? And if not, I can continue. Sure. Um, one of the things we try to share with students as they come into um, the college experience is there may be situations where you find yourself in some sort of legal dilemma or concern. Um, certainly, we know that the drinking age is 21, um, but there is a high correlation of alcohol use with college students that are not 21. So just a few things, I guess, to be mindful of when it comes to legal considerations. Um, certainly, underage alcohol possession or consumption 
Um, there's a zero tolerance statute for driving under the influence under the age of 21. Um, so if you even had just like one drink, one beer, and you get behind the wheel of the car and you get pulled over and you blow point zero 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 one, you're still going to get uh, the charge of what's called a provisional DWI. Um, also things like uh, fake ID charges, there's a big push in Greenville, particularly um, at some places that sell alcohol, serve alcohol um, in terms of checking for fake IDs using the appropriate scanners um, to kind of cut down on use of fake IDs in general. Um, if you find yourself in a position of getting one of these citations or charges, um, please be mindful that there is a process that students can uh, participate in that will help um, expunge it from your record. It includes some community service hours, some alcohol education or counseling, because um, what we don't want to happen is for such charges to impede for any kind of future endeavors that you are looking to accomplish. Thanks, Hillary. Mm -hmm. When we educate students about alcohol, we, uh, and if that's the percentage of students that do choose to consume alcohol, be they age 18 or age 83, we uh, encourage them to be an educated consumer of that product, in this case, alcohol, to know exactly what they're putting into their body. And the research shows that if individuals, students included, count, physically count how much they're actually consuming, that they make better choices. So not only count how much they're consuming alcohol-wise, but try to limit that amount, right? As I said earlier, somebody that uh, drinks little bit of alcohol has a lot less risk behaviorally, legally as well, um, of getting into trouble than some, versus somebody that consumes a lot of alcohol. So in order to set that stage, we have to uh, define what a standard drink is, right? In order to count how much we've had over the course, alcohol we've had over the course of an evening. So that would be a typical 12 ounce beer, can of beer, bottled beer, I'll name a few products here. This is not an endorsement, but these are common mass marketed uh, beers and owls through the United States, like Budweiser, Bush, Beer, Coors, Yingling, Miller, those are 5% alcohol. So that 12 ounce can equals one standard drink. More recently, the hard seltzers have become popular in the United States, as you may or may not be aware. They're taking up more space uh, physically, logistically on supermarket and convenience store shelves. That would be like Truly or White Claws. Conven conveniently, those are also 12 ounces like a standard beer, and they're also 5% alcohol. So those beer products and those white claws are exactly one standard drink. So obviously, if hypothetically I had three white claws over the course uh, of a couple hours, I have had three standard drinks. There's a product called malt liquor in the U.S. government. The FDA specifically does not let the manufacturers of malt products call them beer or ale, even though they are manufactured with very similar and the same ingredients. Let me name a few products here, like Schlitz Malt Liquor Bowl, Old English, St. Ives, Colt 45, those are higher alcohol content can, containing beer-like products. So that's like eight to nine ounces equal a 12 ounce beer. So break it down probably more realistically if I was to go into the sheets down the road here and were to buy a 40 ounce malt liquor containing product like Old English, because they're typically sold in plastic bottles like 40 ounces, I'm not drinking three and a half beers, 12 into uh, 40 being three and a half or thereabouts, right? It's more like I'm actually drinking five standard drinks based on the difference uh, in the alcohol product being seven or 8% versus 5%. Most wine, that's box wine, uh, bottled wine, white wine, red wine is about 12% alcohol. So that's almost, it's not almost, it's more than double the uh, alcohol product in a beer. So that five ounce glass of table wine equals a 12 ounce beer. So it's important to measure these products if you're actually pouring it and not do a heavy pour, because if you're doing a heavy pour of wine, you might be uh, getting actually one and a half of standard drinks. And then a standard liquor shot, most rum, tequila, bourbon, whiskey, gin, vodka is 80 proof. 
cut that in half, it gives you the alcohol percentage. So another way of saying that is 80 proof uh, vodka is 40% alcohol. That 1.5 ounce shot glass, and that's a typical shot, shot size shot glass, that's going to equal one standard drink. So all those things are the same. 12 ounce beer, 5 ounce glass of wine, and a 1.5 ounce shot of liquor. Another way of saying the liquor is, is if you do the math there, it's eight times more potent than a beer product is. I guess the caveat I'll give with liquor is it's not always 40%, right? It could be 100%. So it's not always 80 proof or 40%. It could be 100 proof or 50% alcohol or high end, what's legally sold, what's most uh, the product that's highest legal alcohol percentage sold in North Carolina is 75.5% or 151 proof. So that's almost double the strength of that 80 proof liquor. And again, we're talking about BAC here. We're going to talk about BAC here and what a standard drink is because it's important to talk about blood alcohol level because it plays into what Hillary just alluded to. Potential for drinking and driving 0.08 and higher is illegal for somebody 21 and older and off of the United States, uh, US states. And also very importantly, and sometimes tragically, it can lead to alcohol poisoning. And we'll talk about blood, breath, alcohol level to that as well. So that's why we're defining what a standard drink is. So this is more on liquor. I'm seeing, trying to see if there's anything else here I want to cover. I guess I've said the 151 proof most sold in the ABC stores in the state of North Carolina would be Bacardi. So again, that's almost double the proof of a standard Bacardi rum shot and then Everclear is also 151 proof. So in a standard liquor bottle and in that Tito's bottle there, that's a standard 750 milliliter bottle, that contains about 17 shots of drinker, sorry, of liquor or another way to say that 17 standard drinks. Mind you, if that's 151 proof, that's almost double the strength, 80 proof versus 151. So that 17 shots now becomes about 32 shots. So that's a big difference in those two bottles just based on the alcohol percentage that each, each bottle contains. Hillary, I'm going to kick it to you here to take a breath. Yeah, so I think Bob covered probably most of these. White Claw, of course, we know is the most popular right now. And then other kind of fruity flavored drinks that are still, you know, have alcohol content like La Marita, Strawberritas, Mike's Hard Lemonade, some Smirnoff products, and then uh, Four Loco, which is 12% alcohol, which equivalents to about five-ish drinks in a 24-ounce can. Um, and the different flavors do have a different um, amount of alcohol content in them. So as Bob mentioned, um, blood alcohol content is uh, what we think about in terms of legal things. And of course, the higher the alcohol content in your blood, that is what makes you more intoxicated. So if you look at the two charts here, um, we have one for men and one for women, and you could quickly kind of estimate uh, across the top how much you weigh, and then down the left side, what amount of drinks you have had um, and see where you land in terms of blood alcohol content. Um, it's important to recognize that in terms of men and women, they metabolize alcohol differently. So men will always um, have a slightly less blood alcohol content, even when their uh, other factors are the same. So in terms of men and women weighing the same and drinking the same amount of alcohol, uh, men metabolize alcohol uh, a little faster than women, so they will have a lower blood alcohol content. Thanks, Hillary. Yeah. And I had mentioned earlier, um, as far as blood alcohol content, one of the biggest tragedies that can occur is somebody drinking too much and essentially overdosing on alcohol. Synonymous with that would be alcohol poisoning and alcohol being a central nervous system depressant can mean that it shuts down central nervous system functioning and it could be lethal tragically enough so the blood alcohol level that 
most people, you start to worry about alcohol poisoning. If I can go back a slide here, it's about 0.35 to 0.40. So you can see for, let's say, a 120-pound female on the column on the left there, that's about 10 drinks. So 10 drinks, that female sadly can get up to the uh, level that we would have to worry about alcohol poisoning. Now the way, and Hillary mentioned this a second ago, the way our body metabolizes alcohol, we all, uh, as humans, metabolize about one drink per hour. So to break that down a little bit further, if I hypothetically were to have four drinks tonight, two hours, I would still have two drinks in my system. So it's the rapid use of alcohol chugging, maybe if I can use that terminology, that leads to the biggest risk of alcohol poisoning. So it's about between 0.35 and 0.40 is where you start to worry about alcohol poisoning. 180 pound guy, to go that right side chart there, he's at 0.21 after 10 drinks, if he's chugging them. So it's gonna take about 16, 17, 18 drinks to get it up to the level of alcohol poisoning and start to really have that person medically compromised. Um, and that's again, I just, I guess I just said that, but that's about a fifth of liquor would be that 17 drinks. That would be 80 proof or 40% uh, liquor. The good thing about alcohol poisoning, if there's any good thing about it at all, is that if it appropriate medical attention, the person gets to the emergency department here in Greenville, that would be Biden, says treatable easily by or fairly easily by medical personnel. So it could be reversed and it could save somebody's life. So what we're looking for as far as symptoms of alcohol poisoning, we educate this a lot on campus and we know we talk to many students and many students have seen this uh, scarily enough, either in high school or in college. Again, in a depressant, these symptoms make sense. So the person's unconscious, it's putting them out. Um, or they might be self or so, sorry, semi-conscious. Their eyes might start to roll up in the back of their head. Oftentimes the body's warning signal that they've had too much is person might vomit. So that's an early sign like I'd back off. I've had enough of the substance. It's trying to get rid of it. Other symptoms of uh, alcohol poisoning would be the person's having seizures. If you were to feel their skin, uh, it would feel cool to the touch. So they have lowered body temperature. The skin might uh, start to turn blue because of lack of oxygen to the system. Again, with alcohol being a central nervous system, depressant, that makes sense. Not sure that I want to show you my nails here, but I guess I will. If you start to see bluish tint in the fingertips and the nail part of the fingertips, that might be symptomatic of alcohol poisoning. Um, and the person's just kind of mentally confused. So they're not going to talk. They're not going to. They are talking. They're not going to make a lot of sense. So they kind of call that mental confusion or stupor. So what you can do to help somebody, you know, if, if, you, if you ever do experience this is consider it a medical emergency. First thing to do is turn the person on their side. You don't want them to pass out on their back and then have that person uh, vomit. Uh, you want to not leave the person alone. And then you want to call for help. That could be 911. If you're in a residence hall, it could be an RA. It could be uh, the residence hall coordinator if you are if you're in a residence hall but get that person medical attention and that could potentially save that individual's life about 150 college students a year on average across the country pass away from alcohol poisoning so this is a real thing and hillary and i uh both read earlier this week that two individuals college students in the united states not at ecu but in the united states passed away this past week from alcohol poisoning. So this is definitely something that we want to prevent on our campus. It's been a long time since we've had an alcohol poisoning death on our campus, and we would just like to keep this going on forever as far as people's safety and not having alcohol poisoning and having somebody tragically expire. These are other symptoms, and just in a graph of alcohol poisoning. I've hit on most, most of these. Um, so I think I'll skip this slide, but I think it kind of visually just reinforces it. Hillary, I'm going to kick it to you because you cover the Good Samaritan policy better than I do, quite honestly. So in relation to um, 
alcohol poisoning and getting medical assistance. Um, on campus, we have what's called uh, the Good Samaritan regulation, which essentially means that if you're in a situation, say with a roommate and you're both underage um, and you have both been consuming alcohol, but maybe you're more concerned about your roommate, they're displaying some of those signs and symptoms that Bob reviewed. Um, the Good Samaritan regulation protects you as the caller for help, as well as the person that receives the medical attention um, with the effort of trying to not have people feel concerned or fearful that if they call for help that they'll get in trouble. So essentially, um, several years ago, we got together and, you know, determined that this was needed on our campus because our students do a really good job of getting each other's backs already. But having that extra layer of protection in the Good Samaritan regulation kind of resolves any of that fear or hesitation that students might have in terms of seeking help for someone uh, because of uh, a judicial record or or fearful of getting in trouble. Thanks, Hillary. Um, so when we talk about decision making, I'll reiterate that the safest choice, and this is one of the obvious things, right, is to not drink alcohol. Um, but if a individual student does choose to drink alcohol, there are some things, definite things, uh, that they can choose to do during the course of that evening to make things safer for them and the people around them. And that would be plan before they party. Like, what am I going to do that evening? Kind of set a limit, and the lower the better as far as number of drinks consumed. Uh, think about a safe way home. How are they going to get home? Like, you know, with the Uber and uh, Lyft and other share ride programs, and now have made these choices even now more numerous. Eat a meal prior. That simply does, and it might be obvious, but I think it's worth stating is it slows down the absorption in, of alcohol into the bloodstream just by having something in our stomach. So that's going to make it a safer evening. If you go out with people to consume alcohol that night and socialize, it's also best to try to come back with those people. And like Hillary just said, but I like this term, kind of get each other's backs. You know, we call that pirate supporting. It's just kind of being a good citizen of our ECU community. Um, in the, I'm going to steal from, from, the, from the PowerPoint here and from Hillary, and she says it's this, well, sometimes these kind of common source drinks at a party, you know, kind of PJ, can be sketchy. You don't know what's in it. It could be that 151 Everclear alcohol. You might contain other substance contaminants. In it. So you really, it's hard to measure exactly what you're drinking if you're drinking common source alcohol, right? It's not like having a white claw where you have one white, white claw manufactured in a, in a facility in Chicago and you put it down and that's one standard drink. You don't know what's in common source alcohol. The biggest fear also of something getting in common source alcohol would be a substance a lot like alcohol, come, come, the benzodiazepine type of drug, something like Xanax, and when you mix that type of drug into PJ, that's a one plus one equals three equation as far as central nervous depressant system effects. So it can be very dangerous me medically. We said before, count the number of drinks, kind of, you know, be be on your guard, kind of people are, are, are cool, nice, fine, kind of know who's around you and kind of hang with people you trust and stay with people you trust if you start to feel sketchiness if you know, kind of follow your instincts if something doesn't feel right you know you it's best just to kind of chat with your friend and maybe head home for that evening or find alternate arrangements and different type of plans and it's totally okay you know to consume you know i'm dry mouth here because it's that time of year and i've been drinking water during the course of this presentation but to do that also during the course of socializing um and then certainly and i, I said this earlier don't mix other depressant types of substances or other substances in general with alcohol. The, the benzodiazepine drugs like Xanax is a definite, could be medical emergency, it could be life threatening mixing those type of drugs. And I alluded to this in the beginning, kind of know your limit. That's something that 
it's a lot easier for us to know as 22 year old seniors in college and sometimes it is for first year students coming in where they're kind of testing those limits for the first time. Hillary, would you hit anything else on this slide? This is, slide is a follow up to the previous slide that I just covered. No, I don't think so. I think it's just a little bit of a visual drinking games, I guess. I'm not sure if you went over that or not, but they are. Of course, the situation where you're drinking a lot in a fast manner, so they can lead to, you know, high blood alcohol contents pretty quickly. I did not say that, but I'm glad you did. Thank you. And this is a part of the PowerPoint where we switch from our alcohol uh, focused discussion to focusing on just a few because we can't cover it all. But a few of the illicit drugs and at least in the state of North Carolina. Marijuana is uh, and remains an illicit or an illegal substance. So it is recreationally, certainly medically approved in many states now. North Carolina is not a state in which marijuana cannabis has not been medically or recreationally legalized yet. So that would mean small amounts of possession or certainly possession of paraphernalia would remain a misdemeanor charge. Um, manufacturing large amounts, so forth, distribution could be a felony. So we worry about the legal risks with marijuana. And marijuana comes in many, it's pictured right there beautifully, shapes, sizes, and forms now, right? There's the smokable bud that I'm looking at in the lower left part of the corner. There's the gummy worms, so edibles, and then even drinkables on the upper right part of that screen. Of course, what's also become popular right now is vaporizing uh, THC marijuana, and that would be the cartridges that have become prolific throughout the country large part because they're popular in legal states. So I'll give you a quick warning about the cartridges right now is that some of those cartridges are safer because they're made in manufacturing plants that have sanitary standards in legal states. But there's also another uh, percentage of the cartridges that are being manufactured kind of on the uh, illegal market. And you worry about contaminants getting into those cartridges and causing some lung damage, whereas the safely manufactured cartridges should be safer because they're being made in uh, plants that meet uh, industrial standards. All right. These are higher THC containing uh, products. So these would lead to higher uh, THC effects. And I'll say tetrahydrocannabinol. Uh, THC being the acronym for that, that is the ingredient that marijuana has the most mind altering, mood altering effects. You may have heard of CBD. That's the other chemicals of marijuana that doesn't contain uh, the, the properties that get people high, if I can use that terminology. So CBD would be legal in states like North Carolina because it doesn't cause a high. Some research that shows it might have medicinal purposes where it's THCs that, uh, that the substance that causes the high and that would be illegal in the state of North Carolina. Hillary, do you want to take the cocaine one or do you want me to talk about the cocaine slide? No, I can. Um, so kind of maybe opposite effect for some people for cocaine it is then marijuana a sh really strong probably the strongest stimulant um, drug illicit. Um, so what that means is effects could include um, an increase in your heart rate, blood pressure, risk of stroke, kind of central nervous system overload, which also means that people could be more aggressive or act out not as they normally would in a sober state. Um, and looking at some long term risks or effects is there's a really high potential for addiction, um, chronic heart health concerns, um, which could also lead to stroke or other heart attacks. Um, there's also an increase of depression uh, because the way cocaine works is it um, kind of, <coughs> excuse me, it's, uh, replaces or activates some of those serotonin or dopamine uh, replacement receptors in your brain. Um, and over time, the use of that can 
create um, depressive symptoms. Um, unfortunately, some people become suicidal um, while using um, Coke for a long period of time. Um, and of course, with any amount, even a small amount in your possession, that does equivalent to a felony um, in the legal system. So a lot of times when we hear students using cocaine, um, they say, you know, like, oh, I use it to like help me sober up or so I can drink longer. Um, but that really is a myth that um, cocaine would help you sober up from alcohol. It's really just kind of pulling your brain in two different directions. So if you're highly intoxicated, um, you're more sluggish or not as coherent, um, and then you use cocaine to try to waken yourself up and you're then activating those adrenaline receptors in your brain. So it doesn't kind of uh, cancel out the drunken state you're in. It just adds to with a different effect. Thanks, Hillary. I like the way you said what we're talking about uh, mixing cocaine with alcohol. I'm going to steal that. You're just taking your brain in two separate directions. That's a good succinct way to put it. Mm -hmm. um, Next class of drugs, this is the opposite class of drugs in cocaine, whereas Hillary said cocaine is a stimulant. These drugs are depressant class of drugs. What these drugs specifically do, and they're, they're prescribed uh, legally and beneficially for, would be for uh, pain medication. So these, these are pain management to, tools. So it could be for something immediate like surgery, or it could be something more long term like chronic pain. So you may have heard of or had prescribed these if you like had wisdom teeth or out. It could be like Percocet or Vicodin or Codeine. Uh, harder uh, forms of these substances could be Oxycodone or Methadone. Fentanyl is the strongest class of drugs in the opioid mix, what they call narcotic analgesics. Fentanyl is used illegally uh, to do anesthesiology. So it's uh, during surgery. So it's a potent uh, the potent opioid that, that, that's used in surgery to immediately decrease pain. On the other hand, you know, I talked about why opioids are appropriately prescribed. They also contain, you know, the other side of the equation or coin to use that analogy is you do become tolerant to these substances pretty quickly. And with tolerance then becomes addiction and usually tolerance also means withdrawal symptoms. So if somebody does get habituated to these substances, then tries to quit cold turkey, they're going to have pretty significant withdrawal symptoms. Now, if somebody takes their medication, you know, post-surgery as prescribed, that's going to be completely okay. They're not going to develop a long-term habitual pattern dependency with these substances. You may have heard because the media has picked all over all over this and appropriately within the past 15 years as the United States is undergoing. Uh, an opioid crisis. So uh, we have seen individuals going from narcotic pain pill addiction. It becomes very expensive, very problematic, especially when their physicians start to say, I can't prescribe this anymore. It's too much. People, you know, percentage of individuals anyways are going to heroin use. And the heroin in the United States has become cheaper within the past 15 years and its potency has gone all the problems that uh, heroin addiction uh, accompanies. So that would be overdose potential, especially if that fentanyl that I mentioned earlier for surgery purposes gets mixed into the heroin. So this is something our society has been dealing with for the past about 15 years at a pretty significant rate. Within the past couple of years, there's a substance called naloxone. Its brand name is called Narcan. It's been a really good introduction in the United States. It immediately reverses the effects of an opioid overdose. So if somebody is able to administer it to, to, to themselves or to somebody else, oftentimes it's an intranasal administration. So to put it just into uh, graphic terms, this medicine squirted up somebody's nasal passages. It reverses the effect of the opioid overdose or another way of saying that the person's having a central nervous system. Uh, depressant breakdown, it buys time for the person to uh, get to the emergency department, have EMS come, administer medical treatment, and then ultimately save the person's life. So that 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 antidote for opioid overdose is called again naloxone or Narcan, and it is uh, available, commercial, but it is available at 
pharmacies uh, in North Carolina and across the country now to, in order to save people's lives. And I know that our friends over at Student Health also have this available for students if they're worried about another uh, individual peer. It doesn't have to be another student. It can be any other individual in their life. They're worried about overdose. It's administered uh, without judgment, free to ECU students uh, so they can help administer this life-saving uh, substance called Narcan. Here's just some numbers about opioid epidemic in the U.S. I'm not going to read through these, but we've certainly included this in the PowerPoint. There's the visual perp. Uh, I forgot the slide was here. There's, there's the drug I was just talking about, that life-saving drug that's actually for the first time in a couple of years brought down the percentage of opioid overdose deaths in the United States have gone down the past two years for the first time in 15 years because of the substance. You know, Hillary and I have talked about Xanax during the course of this and benzodiazepines uh, presentation earlier. I'll just hit on it quickly here and move on, but the big four, the most prescribed ones are clonopin, Ativan, Valium, Xanax. These are prescribed appropriately and beneficially for anxiety, for like panic attacks. So they really do work and they have a pharmaceutical purpose. Again, the risk with these substances is people misuse them they become tolerant on them and you become really tolerant really quickly these classes of substances and they have some severe withdrawal symptoms that people are uh, trying to detoxify or detox uh, off of these substances. Oftentimes they have to detox through patient treatment program. And I'll go through this one. And I am going to say again, Center for Counseling and Student Development. That's who we are. It's our friendly staff there. That's our phone number. Of course, we have a website. We have a social media presence as well. Thank you for your uh, attention today, for being a part of this. And I'm Bob Morfitt from the Counseling Center. I'm going to turn it over to you, Hillary, to bring us home. All right. So, um... We talked about uh, the counseling center in the beginning, but if there for any reason you would like to reach out to us for any type of service, here is our phone number. Like Bob said, you can call it um, 24 hours a day. And if you need support um, after our normal business hours, which are eight to five, you would press option two and get the on call counselor. Um, if you're maybe just interested in learning a little bit more about what we do in our office or what services or even some kind of self-help apps or information, you can visit our Counseling Center website. And I think that's it. All right, people, I'm going to end this now and wish you well. Good semester and say peace. Bye.